Hi, this is Peter Holzapple from the DBs, and you are here with me on Icon Fetch. Welcome to Icon Fetch, the web's premier music interview show. Now, here's your host, Tony Peters. Hey, thanks for checking out the show. Now, Big Star's first two LPs were full of chiming guitars, muscled drums, and melodic hooks. And somehow, both albums failed to meet the high expectations. Here we go, Bill. Those failures loomed large as Alex Chilton and Jody Stevens went to work on their next project. Eventually called Third or Sister Lovers, the songs recorded for these sessions seemed at times to be the polar opposite of their first two records, alternating between haunting moments of despair and fragile beauty. Your eyes are almost dead, can get out of bed, and you can see. The album, never officially completed, has been issued over the years in many forms and track listings, but Omnivore Recordings has assembled quite possibly the final word on the legendary project. Jesus Christ was born today. Jesus Christ was born. Complete Third is a three-disc set bringing together virtually every note recorded for these sessions. Through acoustic demos, rough mixes, and about as close as you're going to get to a final version of the album, we get a peek behind the scenes of this fractured masterpiece. Thank you, friends. Wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And to talk about it, we welcome in big star drummer Jody Stevens. Hang on here. Hi, Tony. Hey, Jody. How are you, man? I'm fine. It's the miracle of technology. It really is. I, apparently, you're like, you can't even get uh, cell service where you're at in the mountains, right? Right. I'm uh, uh, enjoying the scenery here in uh, the mountains of North Carolina at the moment. Fantastic. You know, with this with this packaging, this is amazing. It's It's got to be kind of crazy to think about an album that took four years to even see the light of day and never, like, had an official track listing or anything. And now you've got a three CD box set for this. Got to be amazing, huh? It is. It uh, it is pretty remarkable that the music endures and people still care and and uh, not only care but they folks have a passion for it and uh, which enables me to just keep playing and and keep being a part of this pretty incredible community of uh, the Big Star Third live players that Chris Tamey, uh managed to organize and. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a lucky guy. Right, right. It, it, the amazing thing is how they were able, I guess, I guess this was like, a, you know, a 10-year project of trying to unearth, you know, pretty much everything that was, was done for this session. You know, it, you, listening to back at, to any of this stuff, I mean, did you find yourself going, wow, I don't even remember doing that kind of thing? Well, I don't know. Not not so much with the third album. Okay. Um, it uh, and and it, you know and I think in part why why this third album is getting the treatment that it is 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 that Alex you know Alex can engage with his just his voice and a guitar. Thank you, friends. Wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And uh, and given that, and then you know the things that Jim Dickinson added in terms of production values, and uh, c- kind of makes this thing endure. Two, three, four. Whatever it is, Alex's voice has a sort of universal connection uh, to people, even when it's it's melancholy. Uh, it's it's a feeling they can people I think enjoy, including myself, enjoy kind of experiencing through Alex. Here she comes. You 
watch your step She's going to break your heart in two It's true Right, exactly. You know, the the disc one of this box set has these just breathtaking demos where, I mean, you're right, it's just Alex and a 12-string, and it just draws you in. I mean, it's just like, man, these are unbelievably good. Yeah, he's, he was pretty remarkable, I gotta say. Right. You know, and, and then one of the things that's, you know, Big Star's third kind of has this reputation as being kind of taking what Big Star did for the first two albums and kind of sort of turning it inside out or, or whatever. But it's interesting to listen to these demos on disc one because it a lot of these aren't that far removed from what you guys were doing on the first two records. Well, you know, it's it's uh, Alex was certainly the the, the primary writer uh, in in uh, for Radio City and certainly the pr- primary vocalist. Um, and you know, Alex, Alex, uh, again, why, you know, the music and his voice is is so enduring, is uh, it just it reflected where he was in his life, and that sort of honesty is the kind of thing that that endures. <laughs> There's so much written about Big Star Third, and it's like trying to take the myth out of the fact kind of thing is is really hard. Did, did, was there a point where, you know, you guys come off Radio City and it was not successful, just like number one record, so there's like kind of added disappointment there. Was, was there any kind of feeling that, okay, we need to do something different because what we were doing before wasn't working? I, you know, we never really talked much about any sort of musical strategy. Again, it was, it was pretty much where Alex was, and and we all were in our lives at the time, and that's and the music reflected that. There was never a strategy strategy to make anything work. It, uh, you know, as for me, it was just the joy of being in the studio and being a part of the creative process. Driving in my big black. Now, the demos, you know, kind of show that this wasn't just like totally spontaneous or whatever. I mean, Alex had some clear ideas initially. But from what I understand, like he he never played you those demos. So like when you were going into the studio, you were hearing those songs for the first time. Well, in in some in yeah, some of them, but okay. uh, you know, as I as I hear those songs, I remember that yeah, I heard the demos. But it's but when we got into the studio, I may have I may have heard the demos once, uh, and then we would sit down to record them, and uh, I frequently didn't get the opportunity to have more than maybe two shots at, at uh, the drum parts. But by this point, you and Alex had been playing together for a while. So, I mean, w- would it be fair to say that you guys kind of had sort of a, a telepathy going on where you could kind of guess where he was going next? For me, yeah. that's where I connected with Alex most. And, and, and that's, I mean, I think that's where the fun of being in a band is, is that, that connection you have with your other band members. And... Uh, Ooh, yeah, just say, I don't know, and what's produced by that connection. Right. Now, was there a point where, you know, when Alex started doing things that were very un-Big Star-like, like maybe Holocaust or um, Big Black Car, that kind of stuff, was there ever a point in your mind going, well, where is any of this going kind of thing? Or was it just kind of an idea of just trusting where Alex was going? I gotta admit, it it wasn't it wasn't something I was going through at the time. Uh, I think it was kind of a dark period for Alex. Uh, it went, I wasn't experiencing it, so it I couldn't relate to it in that regard. But the songs I, I could appreciate uh, for what they were and and how how Alex was delivering them and the kind of soul of them. 
Right. And, you know, Alex is notoriously not, you know, didn't like to talk about the past a whole lot. So there's just like little fragments of him here and there talking about um, third. And he even alludes at one point that perhaps this wasn't even intended to be called a big star project. I mean, you, you think there's any truth to that? Well, we did talk about the, the name Sister Lovers came up as a possibility. If we didn't call ourselves Big Star, we might call ourselves Sister Lovers. Okay. And that's something that Alex came up with. Now, that, that actually alludes to the fact of, of girlfriends that you were dating at the time, right? It does, yeah. Alex was dating uh, Lisa Aldridge, and I was dating Holiday Aldridge. The other two sisters. Okay, all right. So. Yeah. So that's where the, the title Sister Lovers come from. Okay. Um, you know, when you were working on the third, Alex kind of had this idea of, like, let's try something new. You had worked with John Fry on the first two records. Um, what do you think Jim Dickinson really brought to the project? Oh, yeah. I, for me, Jim brought a sense of... of it's gonna be it's gonna be odd to say this, but maybe st- stability uh, in in what could have been a, a pretty unstable sort of situation, and maybe was at times unstable, unsta- but it was still, I think, anchored anchored by Jim, and in the uh, you know in the in the documentary, Jim Dickinson says Alex hands him a you know basically a guitar and vocal performance of Kangaroo and says produce this mr producer and, and jim <laughs> built the tracks jim right. built the tracks around it in, including playing drums Is it also safe to say that maybe he also had maybe a different outlook on what was possible in the studio? I mean, I I can't imagine maybe John Fry approving some of the feedback and some of the odd things that were going on uh, on some of the tracks. Well, John was was the engineer and 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 the mix engineer, and it's like Jim Dickinson said, referring to Jim again, that John Fry would treat distortion with kind of equal respect as he would an instrument in terms of how it was recorded and and, uh, then how it was placed in the mix. So I think musically, John probably thought it was pretty melancholy and dark. I don't know. I'm just kind of guessing, but I mean, I I thought it was. And then... um, some of the, you know, Alex's lifestyle that was going on, in a way, you know, I don't, I don't think, in in some cases, John saw it as a, as an enjoyable experience, but, um, you know, I, I, the the cool thing about John is he let us do, what we wanted to do. We didn't have really have anybody looking over our shoulders. And did we ask for John's opinion about things? Yes, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> but um, I think, you know, John had a killer set of ears and was really open-minded about music. And and uh, so I, I think so that's why Big Star was able to be Big Star. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, what was there a point where, I mean... It, in the Big Star documentary, Jim Dickinson talks about how there was a point where you just had to say, enough is enough, we're done, and let's see what we have from here. Do you, I mean, do you remember feeling any kind of tension at that point or kind of like, hey, we're not finished? Or, you know, what was maybe the mood as the sessions kind of came to a close? I, I it's It was a long time ago, and I... It, but I just remember the sessions being, 
I don't know that we had a start and a stop date, and maybe that was was what they were referring to. Um, you know, we'd go in and cut some songs, and uh, and I was, you know, I was doing other things too. I was going to school, and you know, I had a girlfriend, and uh, so, and it was just the two of us with uh, you know session players, my brother kind of being one, Jimmy played on bass on for you and Tommy and Kathy played bass on a bunch and there's some other folks but I uh, it wasn't so much a sense of a band and you know I, I wasn't sure how we were going to move forward and didn't really care I just like being part of the recording process and kind of soaking that up and... nothing can Uh, and whether there was an end, you know, I figured we had enough material for a record. And what, I don't know, I forget how many songs there were, but there were a bunch. Right. Now let's talk about For You, because that it was a song that you wrote. When I come home so cold at night, you'll have the fireplace burning bright. Thoughts of how it is going to be and how I'll During, like, the first two albums? I mean, were you writing behind the scenes and just not getting songs on the on the record? Like, where, where did the origins of For You come from? Well, uh, to answer your question about writing songs for the first two records, no, I wasn't. Okay. But uh, Andy, Andy Hummel had given me an acoustic guitar, and Alex taught me some chords. And so I put the chords together and wrote some lyrics for it. And uh, that became for you. And then I wanted to have a like a string quartet on the record. And so I, uh, Carl Marsh had been working in one of the other studios, and I, I knew Carl and asked Carl if he would do some strings. And and uh, you know Carl came over and was doing strings, and apparently it sort of piqued Alex's interest about strings. And that's how the strings were introduced to yeah. uh, the third record, which were you know pretty sort of major part of that record i think so that's that's kind of how for you came about and then i guess i segued into how the strings came about for the record yeah no and what's interesting on the on this box set there is a take of for you with alex's vocal Was it initially like, did you like not want to sing it or how did that? What was no, on? Alex, Alex was doing a guide vocal. Okay. All right. Gotcha. All right. Interesting. Interesting. And, uh, and wow, it's really good too. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's well, awesome. I mean, you know, Alex has had a way of delivering a song. He did. He did. And so when this record I mean, you said, you know, you just enjoyed playing in the studio. It's like, okay, you know, fine, all right, you don't know if the sessions are over or whatever. But uh, it's interesting, like, in the Big Star documentary, Jim Dickinson talks about how he kind of forbid Alex from finishing the project because he felt like Alex would kind of ruin it. Do you, was there any kind of sense that that was, was he was kind of in a destructive tar- part of his life at that point? I think, yes, I think uh, there was that sense of... Uh of Alex being, you know, in a little bit of a destructive part in his life. And who knows what the third album would have been if Alex would have participated in mixing it. And I'm not sure how all that went down. Uh, but, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the mixes, I think, are brilliant. And, um, you know, it all worked out. Right. And right. we are looking at a complete third. Right, sure. And... When did you first kind of get an inkling that Big Star was going to be around? People were going to continue to talk about it. I mean, you know, the first two records didn't meet expectations, and then third didn't even come out for, you know, several years after it was recorded. Um, When did you first start of 
kind of get inklings of like, wow, this people are still caring about this kind of thing. I was in London. I spent two and a half months in London in 1978, and I'd pick up various music papers, and there'd always be something about Big Star in them, whether it was somebody looking for a Big Star record in the back of the, uh, you know, magazines or papers, or there was an article about Alex, or there was, you know, a mention about Big Star, and then, you know, the very early 80s, Mike Mills would say something nice, or Peter Buck, or... And then just, uh, that just kind of carried on. And, well, the cool thing is, in the 70s, the only audience we had were rock writers, really, that were familiar with the record. And the only, only real big star audience we played to was the Rock Writers Convention in Memphis, you know, where everybody knew the songs and were familiar with the record, which would have been, I guess, number one record at that time. Because uh, we got back together after that to do Radio City. So, um, yeah, I uh, those those were the kind of inklings that I would have um, about this stuff enduring and 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 it's interesting because on the complete third, what one of the great things about if you actually pick up the package and just don't you know sort of download it or whatever, you've got this great booklet with, I mean, it's like an endless amount of artists that are, you know, paying their respects to this album, you know, Chris Stamey, Peter Halsapple, Mike Mills, Mitch Easter, the bangles. I mean, it just goes on and on. It, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. I can imagine like for you to sit and thumb through this and read all these people who have been touched by third. Yeah. They're just all beautiful people. They're all just, they're all wonderful friends now. And it is, it's, it is definitely moving uh, and touching that they've done this. And, and I guess most of them have participated in Big Star's third live at some point. Um, and then, you know, of course, it's Cheryl Pavelski and, and, and always delivering like 120% of what you think she might do uh, and just care. And it's, she just has a passion for it and is, is amazing at what she does. Well, and it's amazing that we still have record labels like Omnivore because they've just, you know, done, you know, this. It's a great, it's a great thing that something like this can come out and have such great packaging and everything. So, I mean, you you, you mentioned um, the third shows. It, is there another one in the works at all? I mean, um, would there well, be... we have a we have a documentary of the third live coming out at the first of the year that Concords. Uh, it's, it's produced and will release then. Nice. Okay. Uh, and that's going to be pretty exciting. I think it was certainly exciting to do it, as it always is, and be a part of that community. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I have that to look forward to. And, you know, I have a kind of a, a new band called Those Pretty Wrongs, and we had a release early this year, and we were, uh, we're just starting on a new rec writing a new album so that's fun and and i still get to do big star things too so right. and, and i think there'll be more there'll be more big stars third live performances nice and you're and you're still working at ardent is that true still at ardent uh celebrating our 50th anniversary there wow Unbelievable. Um, so it's uh it's it's john fry's legacy i it's uh you know, it's John Fry's mentoring and and um, and and caring, mentoring and caring about people. I think is is um, how we got to fifty years. Right, absolutely, that's great. So, all right, Jody, it's been great talking to you. The new three D set, the complete third from Omnivore Recordings, and uh, actually can't wait to see that new documentary about the, the live version of it, too. So I appreciate you talking to us. Sure. Glad to. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. It's Jody Stevens there, the drummer for Big Star. And if you've not seen the Big Star documentary, Nothing Can Hurt Me, it's easily available on uh, various streaming services, and it really does clear up the... Uh, um, the story about Big Star and how, you know, this band was primed for huge success and it uh, just kind of never happened. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the third album 
definitely can be a difficult listen. Um, and if you check out the first two Big Star albums, gives you a little better idea of how different Third was to the other two. Uh, we have a review of the complete Third box set on our website. That is iconfetch.com. Until next time, I am Tony Peters. As always, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. You've been listening to Icon Fetch with Tony Peters. Want more great interviews? Head over to iconfetch.com. There, you'll find every interview we've ever done, plus CD reviews, This Day in Music, and a random album of the day. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Who is Tony going to interview next? It could be you. Send what you've got to Tony Peters. Icon Fetch, P.O. Box 292134, Dayton, Ohio, 45429. Or email Tony at host at iconfetch.com. Until next time, this is Joe Kelly. Have a great day.